I want to ask you again to turn to Colossians uh, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 8 again. In fact, uh, as we uh, uh, list uh, several things in this particular sermon, not all of them, but many of the uh, considerations that we give will come from the book of Colossians because of the nature of uh, that body of believers and in the region in which Paul uh, sent this letter um, and how they handled the gospel and, and how they viewed the gospel and how they prospered in the gospel is very beneficial uh, for us today. So we're going to look at some things uh, from the book as well as other passages of scripture. But again, Colossians chapter 1 verses 3 through 8. Paul says, in our prayers, for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of God the truth, the gospel that has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, bond servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. In order for a local church, a local congregation to continue to exist, and that should be the objective, is for it to continue to exist. In order for this to happen, it has to add to its membership. In other words, this local church has to to grow numerically if it's going to continue to exist. It's not the only thing that it must do, but that's a, a, a very integral part in that congregation having a, a long existence and to, to carry out God's word in a particular region, in a particular uh, proximity, uh, in a particular neighborhood. This growth uh, when, the, when we think about this growth numerically, well, again, Marvin, my brother Marvin always talks about the maturation. And it's so uh, biblically accurate when he describes the importance, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the, the maturity, the growth that we're all supposed to experience in terms of maturation. But it's important to understand the, that there are benefits to and that there's a necessity for us to grow numerically. The Lord wants to expand his kingdom in all generations. And so what understanding this understands that this helps us to understand, should we say, that this growth, when we have numerical growth, it helps facilitate many of the church's needs and to fulfill its purpose. In other words, what I'm saying is, is that when the church is experiencing numerical growth, several things that God wants the local church to accomplish gets accomplished. Just when we grow numerically. For example, when the church grows, it fulfills God's command to glorify him to the world. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. God's desire is that Christians do what? Magnify his excellent name. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 9, numerically growing helps us to obey this command. Peter says in verse 9, but you, in terms of your identity, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, is how Peter designates us. God's peculiar people or God's own people. We belong to God, is what he's saying. And God purchased us through his blood for a purpose. He says, God did it in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm saying to you that when we grow numerically, we, we do what? We began to fulfill this command to glorify God. 
We show the world that there is what? Power still in the gospel and power in living the gospel. That there is a power in us worshiping and working for his glory. So when the church grows, that's what happens. When the church grows, also it fulfills God's command to preach to every creature. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, that's what Jesus says. All power and authority has been given to me. And he tells the apostles to do what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, when we are growing, that's what we're doing. We're connecting and talking to what? Different people within the scope of this country, within the scope of this neighborhood. Folk of so-called all different ethnicities, all different socioeconomic backgrounds or whatever it may be, when we are going out and we are growing numerically, we are becoming in many ways a a multi-varied group and a mixture of people, all under the blood of Christ, but a mixture of people people, different people that, again, what? Show the glory of God. That's what happens when we grow. Even in this little congregation, our small congregation, this small number, if you talk, there are so many differences here, different backgrounds, different upbringings, different uh, all types of things, all manner of things. But this is because of where we come from. The places that we've come from, but we all come under the banner of his blood and under the banner of his glorious and his righteous word. And when we grow numerically, we what? We become, in that way, a larger group of, of, of varied individuals. When we grow numerically, it's, what we learn is that the members here develop a more excellent faith. What I'm saying to you is uh, that when we go out and when we talk to people and when we are growing numerically because we are preaching and teaching the gospel there is something that happens to our faith God wants us to grow in our faith well part of that is facilitated when we grow numerically because we go out and we talk to people and we preach the gospel and through that exercising of preaching we ourselves become what Uh, have we developed a more excellent faith and then when we again exercise this this life together in Christ when we deal with all of the different situations as God's people what do we do we grow in our faith as we come to know each other and as we come to learn how to deal with each other that's what God wants us to do that's part of the reason in other words why God wants us to grow numerically not only to expand his kingdom but it also what it exercises our faith and it makes us to have a more genuine faith a more excellent faith and we become more confident in the gospel you look at passages like Acts chapter 5 Verses 27 to 32, you see that when they spread the gospel, whether it was the apostles or the first century church as a whole, their faith, they became more bold in their faith. Well, God facilitates that by us growing numerically, by us going out and spreading the gospel, which leads to that growth numerically, as well as dealing with one another from a day-to-day standpoint. That's what God wants us to do. When we grow numerically, it becomes more financially, the church becomes more financially sufficient. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, we develop a treasury that helps us to meet needs of all kinds. When the church grows numerically, the church becomes more equipped to meet broader needs. In other words, when you have a diverse group of people, then we are able to do what? Meet the emotional and spiritual needs of one another because of the diverse backgrounds and the diverse experiences of one another we can meet the needs of each other when we have for example mothers who have raised children and fathers who have raised children and then we see young mothers we are able to meet those particular needs and to help out because of those very things because of our own diverse experiences we're able to meet diverse needs within the lord's church and this is what paul was describing in romans chapter 12 verses 3 through 8 And then we can go on and on in terms of of these wonderful things that come from us growing numerically. What I'm saying is that every member of the Lord's church here, we ought to have it in our hearts. We ought to have a strong and a deep desire to grow not only in terms of maturity, but we ought to want to grow numerically. We ought to want to grow numerically. We ought to be preparing ourselves to help in any way that we can for this place to to grow numerically. But the local church, in other words, has to do what? 
It has to, and this is what Brother Marvin talks about, it has to mature and have accomplished certain goals within itself. In other words, the local church has to, to acquire certain characteristics and certain traits in order for it to do what? To be equipped to deal with that growth. It has to have internal achievements or milestones among the members before the church can really commit to having a sustained and a habitual growth. But that ought to be our goal. We ought, in other words, be prepared and we ought to be mature, a mature enough congregation so that when we have people being baptized into Christ, that we're able to handle them spiritually and meet those particular needs. We ought to reach those milestones. We ought to examine ourselves as a church to see how far we are from acquiring those milestones or whether or not we have reached those milestones. We ought to look at these things, and, and there are other things as well that we're going to mention. We ought to look at these things and recognize whether or not we are striving vigorously to acquire these things. But we ought to strive for it. We ought to want to grow numerically. Just like the individual Christian needs to mature inwardly in order to go and teach others, in order to be sufficient in helping folk in their needs. Similarly, the local church as a whole must achieve certain milestones of maturity before it is able to help its babes in Christ. Before we can even receive babes in Christ, we ought to be ready. You know, it's just like in a home. If, if a family is expecting a child, if a husband and a wife, they're expecting a child, they don't wait until that woman gives birth. They prepare for the coming of that child. And every local church ought to be prepared to receive babes in Christ so that they can meet those particular needs and those babes in Christ can grow to maturity themselves. But only a mature congregation can handle that. But we ought to strive for that. We ought to strive for it. Otherwise, the church, and we see it, if you look at the Lord's church, otherwise the church can bring men and bring women into the local church, and then what will happen if they're not ready, they will lose them again. This is why what we see a lot of times in the congregation of the Lord's church, we lose members that we baptize because the church is not committed to maintaining them and to helping them to grow in maturity. See, when a local church is baptizing others into the Lord's body, it must be equipped to maintain them in their faith, to help them to meet certain needs, and to help them to, to handle certain situations, and to help their faith become more and more pure. That's what Peter's describing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. All Christians ought to develop a genuine faith, a pure faith, and it's the local congregation, part of its responsibility to help every member to acquire that genuine faith. So now, how do we acquire that? Well, first I want to talk about a couple of things, and then we're going to get into some considerations, some of those milestones. But first and foremost, of course, there is a reason why God in his wisdom and in his infinite and immeasurable knowledge created the church to have organization within that structure. Whether you have a located preacher or we're talking about an eldership and deacons who can facilitate a certain work, God did that because, again, in his wisdom, he, he understood that that is the greatest way for these things to, to be achieved. But, again, it doesn't mean that when a church is not fully organized, that that church should not be committed to baptizing folk and bringing folk out of the world and into the marvelous kingdom of his dear son. We still can strive to be a congregation that is teaching folk the gospel. An integral part of that, of course, is leadership. A fully organized church. But it does not take away the responsibility nor the ability for a church without a fully organized leadership. They can still help folk to grow. A church not fully organized can still reach a certain stage of maturity where it is capable of not only growing itself but sustaining its membership. And increasing in its membership. So let's consider some of these things. Now the first thing. What's one of the first. If not the very first. 
milestone of maturity that we here ought to strive for. The very first thing, I believe the most important thing is for us to strive to develop and to have, first of all, a respect and a committed reverence for God's authority. Now, I want us to think about that. Now, you might say, well, that's just obvious. Again, if we are God's people, then that's what we ought to believe, and that's how we ought to act. But that, I've found, is not as easy for some as just stating it. <laughs> the reality is, is that among God's congregation, among God's churches, you have a lot of folk who don't respect and revere, and they're not committed to what? His authority and the authority of his word. And one of the reasons why you see churches of Christ dwindling in numbers, this is not the only reason, but one of the reasons is, is because if, in other words, if you don't do God's thing, do things God's way, then you're not going to, and you shouldn't expect godly results. That's the reality of it. Churches so easily and so readily succumb to the whims and to the wills of men that ultimately they may experience a boom, and experience growing in numbers, but you're not really producing folk who have a reverence for the God that saved them. And so when they hear sermons or certain aspects of God's authority preached from a pulpit or taught in a classroom, we have too many Christians that if they don't like what they hear, they're going to another congregation where they can hear exactly what it is that they want to hear. And that's not the way that you grow a church and mature God's people. Again, I had lunch with uh, some wonderful brethren in the Lord's Church from another congregation this week. And one of the things we talked about was, again, when you've heard me say it, if you've been here for, for any length of time, you heard me say it over and over again about the type of culture. We're not talking about a uh, racial culture or uh, 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 an earthly culture. We're talking about a church culture. In other words, what it is that we want to implant in the minds and in the hearts of the believers here so that certain things are tradition among us here at Utica, that we're known for certain things. One of the things that we must be known for is a people who bow the knee to God's word and to his authority. We want to create. That's how you grow. That's how you mature in a spiritual sense. And that's how the church is able, therefore, if when we grow in that way, when we are obedient from the heart, when we have a reverence for God's word, it's just, just natural that we're going to go out in that same obedient heart and tell people about the gospel in the first place. But it's so important, it's so important in the Lord's church that we all have this mindset that if God's word says it, it doesn't matter what I once believed. It doesn't matter how I grew up. If God said it, I believe it and I'm going to obey it. That's how we ought to have. That's the type of mindset that we ought to have. If you don't believe me, look at Colossians. Look at chapter 3. Now let's study the book together. And there are so many great benefits from the things that we're going to talk about today. But look at Colossians. Look at chapter 3. And, and, and let's look at the attitude that the Apostle Paul is describing that we ought to have. Let's start with verse, verse number 12. So he had already talked in verses 5 about what things we ought to put to death. He says, put to death whatever in you is earthly, and he lists a host of things. So he's talking about certain things in the Christian's life that a Christian must get rid of. But Christianity, as we've said before, is not simply a matter of stop doing certain things. It has to be about adding things, godly qualities to our life. Am I, am I right about that? The, being a Christian is not simply not drinking or simply not stealing anymore. But God says not only do you, should you not steal, but go out and work so that you may give. So God is a productive God. God is a fruit bearing God and he wants his people to bear fruit. It's not enough for us to just stop doing some things we ought to add and to become some things. And so he says in verse 12, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, 
clothe yourselves, put on new clothing with compassion. It's not enough for you not to just mistreat people. Brother Paul, he says, but have compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if any has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. All of these are attitudes that we have to develop. Now watch what he says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. In other words, if you're not a, a person that is wise in God's word, then you can't teach folk and you can't admonish them. So we all have to develop what? A, a spirit of wisdom from God's word that we're able to teach and admonish one another. Right? Admonish one another with what? Teach one another in what? Well, listen, just keep reading. He says, with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He, in other words, and I know we've heard it over and over, but hearing it is one thing and obeying it is another. He said that if God's word says it, that is the first and final authority, and that settles it. God's word is what settles the matter. And we all ought to humble ourselves under his authority. Jesus is going to say to many on that day, why call me Lord, Lord? And then when he says, why call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you? He says that on that day when he comes back, there are going to be folk that say that I, Lord, I, I served you. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He's describing folk who do not respect his authority. All of us hear things in God's word that are counter to our, our growing up, counter to our experience. But in terms of God's word, that has to rule. Talking to those same brethren, we were talking about the, the diverse ideas in the Lord's church. Wonderful time with those brethren. But we talked about how in the church, even through this past political climate, how there are folk probably in this place who, who consider themselves to be progressives politically, consider themselves to be conservatives politically. Some conservatives distinguish themselves as independents. And we have all of these different ideas, all of which deal and touch moral issues. And so what I said to those brethren is, it's all right at, at some point we differ on those things as long as we all come at some point to believe the same things. At some point. That's why we come here. It's not for you to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that. I just won't make mention of that. No, we are supposed to all come to have our ideas dispelled so that we can have the mind of Christ. And this is what you find in the church. This is what causes problems. And then when you try to teach folk, again, they, they will leave or they don't want to hear it because they want to believe and hold on to those particular beliefs. That's not the attitude that a Christian ought to have. We ought to come here with the spirit that is ready to be convinced from God's word. Amen. We ought to be ready to be convinced by God. God says in the book of Isaiah, come and let us what? Reason together. God said that at a simple time. I heard you, but you have to listen to me. We have to bow down to his authority. That's the first thing. And we ought to strive for that. All of us ought to want that. We ought to teach our new babes that. We ought to live that ourselves. That if God said it, then we're going to live it. Number two, when a, the second milestone. So it's about God's authority, but the second milestone that we ought to strive to achieve in terms of maturity as a church is to become a hope-filled church. We ought to strive. And that milestone that we ought to want to achieve is to become a hope-filled or a hopeful church. Look at Colossians chapter 1 again. Look at what he says in verse 3 again. And notice what, what Paul says. Now, again, he's describing a church here and a, and a body of believers and 
believers in that particular region that embodied a certain attitude and produced certain fruit. So Paul says this. He says, verse 4, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Now watch what he says in verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Isn't that powerful? Uh, what I'm, I'm saying to you is I want you to notice that living faithfully to God, having the proper love, loving one another is made possible when what? We have a hopeful spirit among us. In other words, hope and this expectation of receiving heavenly things enables us to do what? Live faithfully and to love properly. The reason why in the Lord's church that you have many times Christians who don't live faithfully and they don't love properly is because they are fixated on earthly things instead of having a hope that is laid up for them in heaven. We ought to develop the attitude that in this life we live in this world, we work in this world, we move from place to place in this earthly world, but we are spiritual people. And as Paul says, our citizenship, my real citizenship, where I really live, is in the home of God, in heaven. And in essence, as Paul says in Philippians, it is from there that we are expecting a savior. When you are fixated and your mind is fixed on the Lord's return and receiving that heavenly inheritance, it enables you to transcend this earthly life in your mind. And your behavior follows it. Hope and a heavenly expectation enables us to achieve wonderful things and produce godly fruit. Hopeless Christians, and we have folk in the Lord's church who are hopeless. Hopeless Christians are what cause dissensions. Why? Because if they are hopeless, then they think really in essence, even though they're supposed to think spiritually, they look at this world and they think that all that matters is this world. Now they'll tell you something different. But in reality, they're scratching just like the world to achieve things. And so they, they are the ones, as we talked about in Sunday school, they cause dissensions because their aim is not a godly aim. Their mind is not set on heavenly things. As Paul says, their minds are set on earthly things. But when our minds are fixed on Christ, we don't cause dissensions. It's those who hopeless Christians that cause dissensions they compete with each other therefore the people that are hopeless who don't focus on their heavenly hope they never grow because their focus is on worldly things we have in the Lord's church too many worldly believers this is why you don't see work in the church and productivity in the church work being done in the Lord's church but hopeful people and hope Field Christians are able to overcome not some, Brother Paul, or most circumstances. When a person's heart is filled with the hope of heaven, they can overcome any situation in this life, in any circumstance in this earthly life. They dedicate themselves to eternal things. They lose loved ones and folk die. They grieve and they mourn. And they press on. They experience material loss. They experience the loss of relationship, and you know what they do? They endure. They have children that may curse them and walk away from them, but because their expectation is in the Lord's return, they press on. There are a lot of Christians whose hearts have been broken, but they focus on the Lord, and they are able to endure. And we ought to have that attitude in the Lord. That's what the church is supposed to be about. We always talk about being the Lord's church, but being the Lord's church is mimicking the first century. And one of the reasons why the first century was so successful in suffering and yet enduring is because the apostles preached to them and the church accepted that our hope is in heaven. That's where our hope is. That's where our hope is. And we ought to be folk who are filled with hope. It will change your whole behavior. It will. It will change when your mind is just filled and your heart is filled with, with spiritual things. 
It will change how you live and how you act everywhere that you go. And we ought to become hope-filled people. Number three, we ought to develop a firm grasp on the message of grace. And this is so timely. This is so important in the Lord's church today. And I'm not saying this to offend anybody. Really, I'm not. Because I, I, I place myself within, again, the framework of this responsibility as well. But we ought to learn God's word in the Lord's church. We really do. We ought to have a firm grasp on God's word. Because, again, if we don't, then all we're going to do is lose folk. I was watching a particular documentary, and I won't name that documentary, but it, it's describing how this individual at one time had considered himself to be a Christian. He went from being a Christian to Islam, and the reason why he stated that he went from Christianity to Islam is because in Christianity, many of the questions that he had, the Christianity didn't answer them, and Islam did. So he quickly became a Muslim. And I say, who were the folk teaching him around him? Because the Bible has all the answers. It does. God has the answers, but the problem is, is that in the church, we don't know how to give them. We haven't studied enough to help folk. And so the church has become just a place that we come to and we gather together, we worship, and then we go about and live our lives the way that we want to live our lives. That's not what Jesus designed. That's not what the church is supposed to be about. We're supposed to be able to meet emotional and spiritual needs because we are wise in the word of God. Isn't that what Paul said in Colossians? To teach with all wisdom. We're supposed to have wisdom. We're supposed to not in our own and our own selves have a confidence, but have a confidence in God's word. That when folk come to us and say, what does the Bible say about this? That we can tell people. And that we can teach. If we don't have a, a, a good wisdom of God's word and a firm grasp on the message, we, can't, we can have all the classrooms that we want. We can't fill them. And if we do, we're not going to keep folk there because we don't know what to teach them. There's too many philosophies that are being taught in the Lord's church and not enough of God's word. And we ought to have a firm grasp on God's word. For example, when we talk about this message of grace. You, do you understand that a lot of Christians think that being a Christian is about do's and don'ts? That's not the gospel message. That's not the gospel message. But when we are able to teach people the, the nature of of the meaning of John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son when we look at passages in Colossians where the Bible says that God what that it in essence delighted God's heart to save us when people understand that this high and righteous and holy God loved us so deeply that he sent his one and only son to save us and that we live in a covenant filled with grace a lot of Christians they don't articulate it because they don't believe that. They think that, okay, church is, uh, being a Christian means coming to worship, that we, we do the five acts of worship. If we don't do that, God's going to kill us. That's not Christianity. But when you look at Paul's writings, there's a reason why, and thank God for the book of Romans because Paul talks about that covenant that we have entered into when we are baptized and we obey the gospel. He talks about this covenant of grace. Same thing that is in John chapter 1 when the Bible says that we have received grace upon grace in Christ Jesus. And when you begin to tell people that what being a Christian is about is striving to live like him because he loved us so deeply, but that he has given us a law of pardon that when I sin and I will sin, that his grace does what? Washes away my sin. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it wonderful to know when, when you have contemplated your imperfection, when you have contemplated and you fully understand that you are always going to fall short of his glory, but to know that there's a passage in 1 John that says that if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only for your sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Isn't that beautiful? Then it makes folk want to come and worship him and not see it as just something that is that I'm being compelled to do, that I am being 
forced to do. God wants us to come here because we love him. And you will only know him. Remember that old song? To know, know, know him is to what? Love, love, love him. And we do. To love God, you got to know him. When you know him, your love grows for him. But we have done a poor job at preaching and teaching the authentic message of grace to folk. Yes, there are warnings. And there are things we're going to get to that. But that message of grace that we live in and that we live under, it's a wonderful thing. But not only developing a firm grasp of his message and knowing God's word to meet those needs, we ought to know that a milestone of maturity is becoming known as a faithful church. We ought to have that in our hearts. That ought to be our desire, that when folk talk about us here, when folk talk about the congregation of Utica, that they say that that is a faithful church. That we have a reputation, again, of people who bow the knee to God's authority and to his word. Now, what would that do? That would make folk in the neighborhood when they hear, yeah, there are 10, 15 churches in that neighborhood. But that one over there, they stay in the Bible. They read the Bible. They believe the Bible. They live the Bible. They love the Bible. That's what's going to happen when we develop that reputation. And when we develop that reputation among the brotherhood and they are in a congregation that does not respect the authority of God, they're going to say, I'm going over there where they love God's word. Amen. That's the reality of it. We ought to be a, known as a faithful church, one who is committed to God's glorious word and to glo God's glorious will. That's what happened in the believers in Colossae. Again, look at what Paul says. Verse 3, in our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard. Paul says, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Paul had not yet met these believers. He says, but I've heard about you. You have a, a firm, solid reputation in God's glorious word. And you are known as a faithful church. And you are known as folk who are producing in God's glorious word, we ought, to, we ought to strive to have that type of reputation in the world. But not only that, number five, we ought to properly handle sin. We ought to properly handle sin. Again, this first involves when folk repent, when folk are humble, to have a merciful and a patient attitude toward them. Now, we, we've not always been known of that in the churches of Christ in America. I can't tell you how many folk have come to me and say, well, I, I used to be a member there, or I visited there many times. Those, those folk, you guys know the word, but you're not the most merciful people. I'm not the only person that's heard that. And I'm saying to you that our Savior is a gentle and a kind and a merciful Savior. When Jesus encountered people that were in sin. Jesus did not validate the sin, but Jesus was counter in attitude and in behavior than what the Pharisees and those hypocrites acted like. He showed them that God's heart was open to them when they repented, that God's heart was open when they were humble to receive them. And that what brought you to the Lord Jesus? Hearing about God's mercy? Hearing about God's patience, his long suffering with us? And look, let's before we close out, look at Luke chapter 6. We only have uh, a few more things to say, and then we're going to let the lesson be yours. Luke chapter 6. Start with verse 35. Jesus speaks here. He says, But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Jesus says in verse 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Now look at what he says after this. One of the most beautiful teachings of the Lord. He says, do not judge. In other words, he's not talking about taking God's word when someone is sinned and not applying it. He's saying, don't act as the arbiter of vengeance. That's not your job. To punish that's not your job, as Jesus is saying. And he's saying, according to the same passage, but in Matthew, he's saying that judgment is when you're doing this very same thing 
Don't act as if it's all right for you and not all right for everybody else. That's what he's saying here. But he says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put in your lap for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. What's he talking about? Mercy. That's not money he's talking about. That's not material things. Now I know those prosperity preachers will take that and act as if that he's talking about financial and material he's talking about mercy now let me ask you a question as we get ready to conclude how many of us need an abundance of God's mercy amen well God will never grant you that mercy unless you're a merciful person that's what Jesus says to be a merciful there are some of us who exhibit not a trace of mercy someone falls and we kick them Metaphorically, or we walk right past them without helping them to lift them up. And here you have the Son of God himself, the Word himself. And yet Jesus did not treat folk like that. And somehow or another, in between his coming and his death on the cross, we have become more righteous than him that we can judge people. Because we don't say to this person that has been taken in sin, I love you, sin no more. But you are loved. We don't do that. They have a reputation for the rest of their lives. They're noted as this person. Don't let a person tell us that they, that they did anything that was sinful because we label them and every time we don't even look at them the same way in the Lord's church sometimes. We ought to be merciful. We ought to be merciful. First Peter chapter 4 verses 7 through 8. Peter says what? Love, genuine love covers what? A multitude of sins. Love does not say, if you do this to me one more time, I'm done with you. Not to one that is forgiving and one repentant. But then, this whole concept of handling sin does involve Matthew chapter 18. We are, that's a milestone of the mature too. A mature church handles sin, and when folk need to be disciplined, they are capable and they are able because they love the individuals that are taken in sin. They want them to be saved. They want them to be to live back in God's word. And so they live out what Jesus taught in Matthew 18 about discipline and about correction and about rebuking and then about forgiveness and accepting them again in the body. And then finally, this is so important, a milestone of maturity is you and I exercising the nature of our relationship in him exercising the nature of our relationship in him. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Now, for those who have been here, you've heard me say this over and over again, and, but this may be new to folk hearing it virtually and new to some of us in here. What we need to understand is that the Bible teaches in Scripture, when you see the term in the relation to the church, koinonia in regards to the church, it's describing who we are. We are the fellowship. And if we are the fellowship, then what we need to do is, number one, learn what that means and then exercise that behavior. In other words, what I'm saying to you, to give you an example, okay, let's say that I become president of the United States. I'm not running for office, by the way, but let's say I become president of the United States. When I take that oath of office and I go into that historic building and it all begins to hit me I can no longer act in the capacity only of what my previous life called me to do I have to understand that I'm the president now and that president means that there's certain behavior that's indicative I can't sleep in on Saturday mornings anymore if there is a council if there is some treaty that needs to be involved in the president then I have to be ready to do those particular things there are daily meetings. I have to be briefed on a whole. I have to act what? Presidentially. Because it's the nature of the office. And in the same way, when we obey the gospel, we instantaneously became what? God's children, which means that we are what? Brothers and sisters. And I'm saying we ought to act like it. We ought to act like it. What do brothers and sisters do? Preacher, I'm saying to you, 
find out what God's word says and then do it. <laughs> How should brothers and sisters treat one another? Find out what Jesus says and then you exercise it because we are the fellowship so we need to act like it. We are brothers and sisters. That means that hearing about each other once a week, talking to each other once a week, and he's not talking about just a dysfunctional family, he's talking about the best possible way of exercising a brotherhood that we've been brought into by his blood, we ought to exercise. We ought to know about each other. We ought to love each other in a certain way. We ought to care about each other. We ought to weep with one another. We ought to rejoice with one another. We ought to exercise the nature of that relationship. We ought to find out what God's word says, that brothers in Christ, how they act, and we ought to just practice it. The more we practice it, the more it becomes our conviction, and the more it becomes what? A tradition here. So that when we bring folk in here with all of these things, when we bring folk in here, they say, okay, that's how we ought to behave in the church. This is what's not happening in the Lord's church in many congregations. You have a collection of folk who've been baptized, they come to worship, and then everybody goes about their business. And there are some folk who are close, there are some folk who talk, and that's it. But the majority of the church, and that's not how, that's not what the Lord wants in the local congregation. We ought to come to know each other. That means that I have to reach out to you, but you have to have open arms to receive me too. And too many times we're closed off from one another. We ought to call each other. Do you call your brothers and sisters just because? Well, we ought to do that too. <laughs> do you tell your, your brothers and sisters, your biological brothers and sisters, that you love them? You should. And we ought to do it here too. I don't have to know every intricate detail of you for me to put my arms around you and say, I love you. Because in Christ I do. We ought to develop of affection for one another. We ought to have that, but that comes when we, when we spend time with each other. See, we, there are milestones of maturity. We have to examine that. We have to strive for this. And then, brothers and sisters, to conclude, what I'm not saying to you is to not go out and talk to folk. I'm saying we ought to, we ought to be committed to the numerical growth of the Lord's church. We ought to be committed to it. So go out and talk with folk. I know I don't want to, you know, put this brother on the spot. But brother Dana called me this week. And I'm so glad that he did because he had a co-worker that is ill. We're praying for him. We ought to continue to pray for him. He's having surgery tomorrow. But brother Dana asked if I would go down there and I was glad to do so. But we ought to do things like that. So that folk will know what we are about. Brother Dana's love, his Christ-like love for this man enabled me to extend my love through Brother Dana to this man. And by doing that, when he comes out of that hospital and he wants to be a part of a congregation, he's got to at least, Marvin, consider us. He's got to consider us. We want to love and pray for him, his family. But that's what we ought to do in the Lord's church. So... Connect with people in the world and when you can bring them into the church and when the preacher and brothers can go with you and pray with them at a hospital bed or we can take some food to their home, we can say this is done in the name of the Lord Jesus because his love is to you as well. And this is where we worship. So we ought to have that spirit as well. We ought to strive for those milestones. And so if you're here today. First of all, if you're not a Christian, we want to urge you to become a Christian today through faith, repentance, confession, being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. God promises upon your obedience to the gospel that on that day when he receives his own to himself, that he will give you the crown of life that no man can take away. It never rusts, it never decays, provided you walk faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. And if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian and you need to come for the reasons that we spoke of, or for anything else, know that this is a family that loves you. Help us to learn more how to exercise our love to you. If you need to come and make certain requests in prayer, 
to God and you want your family to pray with you and for you or any other reason, won't you come right now while we all together stand and while we sing?